that they they did she said they will see that they did all that they were led by the Spirit of God to do in proclaiming the message under the power of the Holy Spirit and it ended up getting them in trouble that's why they're gonna be praying because the now the enemies are going to rally against us to get rid of us. Remember, the Sunday law comes in three phases. First, there will be an urging of the Sunday law. All over this country, because it's got to start in America, all of this is going to start in America. You will have voices, both religious as well as non-religious voices, urging everybody that we need Sunday. We need a day of rest. Now we know one of the reasons they're going to give is because we've got to save the environment. Mm -hmm. But they'll have other reasons because you're going to have all kinds of disasters taking place and they want to be able to, through the Sunday law, call on God to deliver us from this untoward world. So you are going to have reasons for people seeking the Lord earnestly for help. And here comes these people preaching a different doctrine from all the other spiritual apparitions, familiar spirits, and they call them familiar because it will be people that you knew very well. Coming and telling you stuff, Plus apostles and other holy men, maybe somebody will see Abraham come and tell them what they're supposed to be doing is keeping Sunday holy. But you, just a little band of people, are saying no. The Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord. So their solution to this small problem, with the whole world united, and this small problem. A little company standing in the light, which to them is darkness, is to blot them out from the earth. Then the whole world will be lighted. No troublemakers. That's going to be their plan. And under those circumstances, the Lord will be telling us, okay, just finish the job. Keep going. I have other people. Just keep going. And then there's a certain time the Lord will say, okay, that's it. You've got them all. Now you need to stop. And then he's going to allow them <coughs> to go from the urging of the Sunday law to the enforcing of the Sunday law. So from urging, it goes to enforcing. That's when the United States of America is going to pass legislation saying that we are going to observe a Sunday law now, and anybody who breaks it will be fined or imprisoned. And when that does not work, then they'll go to the third and final step, which is to enforce with death. So they'll enforce it with fines and imprisonment, and then they're going to enforce it with death. So it starts off with urging, then it comes back with legislating, with fines and imprisonment, and then finally it will be enforced with a debt decree. All because this little band, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, has stirred up the whole world with their message. And the people are listening to them. So they believe the only way they can stop them is through the enforcement by legislating something. That's just in front of us. So there's going to be a whole bunch of Antichrist. But Satan is going to be the epitome of it when he comes looking like Jesus himself. He's gonna, he's, he's gonna, he's gonna take the cake compared to all the others who will be popping up, claiming that they are Christ and all this sort of stuff. <coughs> I gotta make sure I understand. The, sure. The two headed beast is the United States. Two horned, yes. Two horned beast. Yeah. 
would be the United States. Yes. And they helped to form the image to the East. East. Correct. By um, uniting. By uniting with, with church and state. Yes. That, that helps to form the image to the East. Correct. And the two headed beasts right. would be the United States. Yes. The two horned beasts is the United two States. Two horned beasts. Yes. Is the United States. Let's go to, and I know I've mentioned this to you all in the past, but I'll do it again in this evening. Let's go to Revelation 13 and look at verse 11. Now I said I was going to make this short, so I'm still going to try, but I, I want to leave this last session open to you all to be able to ask questions as we go along, just to make sure that you get it as much as you can. So if you don't mind allowing people to ask their questions, I have no problem with that. It will help with understanding. Revelation chapter 13. And the key verse I want you to concentrate on is verse 11, first of all. And then we'll get to the others. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he Take as a dragon. Two horns like a lamb. Horns in Bible prophecy represent civil power. The heads represent religious power. This beast has seven heads. No, it has one head and two horns. The one that has seven heads is the one that came up before. If you notice, the scripture says, and I beheld another beast, which means there was another one in front of this beast. Let's go and look at that one, and then we'll come back to verse 11 to discuss verse 11 a little more. Let's go to verse 1. Revelation 13 starts off with describing one beast, and verse 11 comes back and describes another beast. Verse 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. <coughs> This is the leopard-like beast, because when you go on to read, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power on his seat and great authority. This is making reference to the papacy. The papacy is the leopard-like beast. But when you look at the description here, it had ten horns, and it had seven heads. It brings us to the point where the papacy at a point in time is going to be controlling, just like it did in the past, all the civil powers. Ten meaning universal. And all seven heads, meaning all religious powers including Adventism. That's why it's seven and not six. This is what it was like in the time of the Dark Ages. They controlled all the religious body. And they persecuted the true saints. That's why they had to go underground and be in hiding in the catacombs. So this is a depiction of the papacy in the early years, but it's also a depiction of the papacy in the latter days.
they will be in control. That's why one of the things that inspiration said we will be exposing is the rapid growth of the papacy. Mm -hmm. Remember one of the deadly wounds was healed? Well, it's going to come back in full force. That, that wound is already healed today and the, and the papacy is growing in influence all over again. So we're going to see all the churches are going to be under that banner. But then let's go to the other beast that John saw, which is verse 11 now. Let's go back to verse 11. Now that we can understand what he was referring to when he said, And I saw another beast. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast. The first one was the leopard like beast, which we saw was the papacy. Coming up out of the earth. This is a different one now. And he had two horns, not ten. Like a lamb, and he speaks as a dragon. The only nation that we know of that came up in this earth like a lamb, meaning to say innocent, <coughs> having Christ likeness, and having two civil powers connected to it, is the United States of America. America has and still continues to have a civil power uh, that um, projects itself as a Christian nation and the uh, civil power itself in those days was democratic and republicanism. Today we, 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 um, we have a, a different view of things or things have changed um, from the republicanism and the protestantism of the past. In the past, it was they were more Protestants as opposed to just saying, you know, Democrats and Republicans. So it's more a Republican system with um, with uh, Protestants having uh, a, a very prominent role in the government in that time because. Uh, of course, the European Protestants had come to the United States of America and were able to influence this country into becoming a Christian place for, for, for those who were fleeing from the papacy to be able to find some kind of security. But the Bible said, he will speak as a dragon. That's the part we are about to see. We haven't seen anything yet in that regard. We think we, we, think we have seen some Dragonian uh, manifestations, but we haven't seen anything yet. We are yet to see what a dragon, a government with, with real Dragonian characteristics is like. And we will see it when humble, genuine, 100% Christ-like Christians are being persecuted. It will be like the dark ages all over again, and you and I, at that point in time, are going to be the victims. We're going to be the targets. Why? Because we went and proclaimed the truth. <laughs> we went and proclaimed the truth with power, and it shook up this world. Not just people in America will be listening to us. People all over the world will be taking heed of our message and coming under the banner of the seven-day Sabbath. Coming under the banner, wholeheartedly, coming under the banner of the seven-day Sabbath. Because with the power of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain, we are going to bring them to a knowledge of the truth. Now I want you to look at a scripture, a verse, which I have, I always describe as the most misunderstood and misinterpreted verse in the Bible. That's just from my perspective. Look at verse 15 of Revelation 13. Revelation 13, 15. And he had power 
to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. First question you have to ask is, who had the power to give life to the image of the beast? We already know what the image of the beast is. It's that the image of the beast represents all the churches, all the Protestant churches coming together, right? But somebody has power to give them life or give them the authority to promote their position as the required position. Well, the only one who has that power is the beast that came up last, which is the two-horned beast, the United States of America. The two-horned beast is the one that gives the image of beast the power to bring the persecution or the Sunday law. And notice what the Bible says. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. So he give life to the image of the beast by united with the, with the churches, and then the churches will speak. And the churches are going to speak promotion of Sunday law. Of Sunday worship. Sunday worship. And then they'll realize that there's this little band of people who are not listening. This is urgent time. These people are not listening. You know, we've, we've got to kind of watch them because they're dangerous. And after they go through the process of getting so many people to accept it, and the devil backs them up by allowing all these apparitions and spiritualism to. Uh, to spread the message of Sunday sacredness, then the Lord gives us power. We proclaim the seventh Sabbath like none other, and then they realize that their efforts are being pushed back, and that's when they will legis they will enforce it with legislation, which includes, as I said, fines and imprisonment, and. Um, and we will just get a little cautious. We may have, we may have to uh, be a lot more controlled in how we share the message. And we will also uh, be given directions as to when we need to flee to the mountains and hills. Because we are going to have to flee to the mountains and hills. Mm -hmm. Because they mean to kill us. And God will give us an opportunity to flee before the past. Is it at that point, the second phase, when Ellen White talked about um, holding meetings on Sunday? Yes. We are going to then have to, because they've legislated fines, imprisonment, we are going to have to go ahead and have meetings on Sundays to be able to try and get the message still going. But we are going to have to avoid breaking their so-called law. Well, I shouldn't call it so-called at that time. It's going to be real. They're going to, we're, going to, we're, we're going to have to avoid breaking the law by using the time for missionary purposes. I am sure we're going to see some Seventh-day Adventists breaking it. We have a lot of fanatical Adventists who will say, I don't care what they say. You know, God said this is not the, the, a holy day. I am not going to be going to no church on Sunday. And I am definitely not going to be doing anything other than going and rest and work my garden and do whatever I normally would do on a six day a week work period. But inspiration, if we follow inspiration, it tells us we need to keep the day in a way in which we cannot be persecuted unnecessarily. Why? Because the Bible said, be wise as serpents and serpents and So we're going to be wise as serpents and we're going to use the day to do missionary work. Hand out tracts, talk to people. 
But that doesn't mean we're keeping the day holy. We're just not pushing the, the, the button unnecessarily by using the day wisely. That's what intuition said we need to do. Yes, that is the time. We cannot do that when the that decree comes because by that time it means our work is finished, probation is closed for our getting the message across with the love cry, and now we've got to go and take cover because now they're looking to kill us. Even if they find us at that time and we were faithful, that's when the Lord is going to show them that he's on our side, military person, are going to prepare in our defense. Angels are going to come in the form of men of war and defend us if it became necessary. Plus the angels will bring us bread and water. And I'm sure it will be delicious. Whole wheat or whole grain bread <laughs> like we never tasted before. <laughs> Go ahead, sister. So would you say we'll, we'll kind of be like how the water to describe yes. when they were you know, able to give the message, but nobody could pinpoint. Yes. We that gonna, type of what? That type of wisdom. Correct. We are going to have to, after the power, we're going to have to kind of, of be a lot more tactful in getting the message across. So that that relates to the, your first question with the power. It, it, it just shows us that how we and all, just like Jesus, we're going to really be following Jesus in every respect. Just like Jesus, we'll be using the power, not on ourselves, we'll be using the power advance the truth. So even though, yeah, we could still heal people and whatnot, we're just going to be more careful how we go about doing, doing the Lord's work. Okay, let's go a step beyond this now. Um, Desire of Ages, page 431 and paragraph 2. 431 and paragraph 2. Inspiration 6. Earnest Perseverance supplication to God in faith. Faith that leads to entire dependence upon God and unreserved consecration to His work can alone avail to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in high places. The reason for this reference is to show us how much we need our faith to grow, brethren. And how much we need to pray. We have to learn to trust God and we have to learn to utilize God's willingness to help us. The only way that will happen is if we practice doing it now. Because that's the only thing that will bring the aid of the Holy Spirit. And at that point in time, we're going to need the Holy Spirit working for us a lot. A lot. We're going to need the Holy Spirit. And the only way that happens is what is being said here. Earnest, perseverance, supplication to God in faith. Faith that leads to entire dependence upon God. So notice the kind of faith. It's not just me saying, Lord, I believe. Lord, help, help me. I, I, I trust you. I know you do it. It has to be a faith that is manifested in works. Our lives have to be testified yeah. to the fact that we believe that God <coughs> is able to help us. And we are willing, therefore, to depend upon Him entirely. And on reserve consecration, our lives will be, have to be given over to Him so that He can see there's nothing that hinders Him from intervening. This, this comes right back to what I was talking a little earlier about at the table in regards to the importance of our getting to the point where we go back to where we were as as babes in Christ, where we see Jesus as being the answer, the all in all to us in our every single need in our Christian walk. That's where we have to we have to keep going back to that experience from now so that it becomes so much of a habit in us that it's like we are living our first love every day. Every day. That's where you could see when we were babes in Christ, when we started off, it's like we were totally dependent upon the Lord for everything and we were consecrating our lives as though it was no big deal. It was easy for us to it was easy easy for us to comply with anything that we believe the Bible said we should do. We've got to get back to that kind of faith. 
and the people who the Lord is going to use in that time, eh, they're, going to, they're going to be like that. But look at what starts it all. Persevering supplication. We've got to learn to pray. We've got to learn to, to call upon the Lord for everything that we need so that he can reveal himself to us and we'll do it again and again afterwards because we've come to realize he does hear and answer prayer. That alone, as Christian says, <coughs> can avail to bring men the Holy Spirit's aid in the battle against principalities and powers, and we're going to have encounters with a lot of these principalities and powers, all of these spiritual <coughs> stuff. You and I are going to get to a point where we are not afraid if Satan himself appears to us. You know why? We would have learned to trust in the Lord. So all the little problems we have are actually opportunities for us to see God work. We must fall in love with our problems because we will end up seeing every problem is an opportunity for me to see a miracle. You think you think having that kind of mindset will 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 Satan will be afraid of us. Because he knows anything he brings, God uses it to our advantage and we cooperate. Because we see it through the eyes of Christ in us, and we see it as though it's just another stepping stone to spiritual growth and a life of victory. Any problem. Principalities, powers, he think he could come and scare us because he's acting like a devil. No. We're going to see this as another opportunity for the Lord to make himself manifest. Any of you acquainted with uh, um, what was the name of this guy that um, Roger Mono. Any of you acquainted with Roger Mono? If, if, you, if you don't have access to it, I, I could send you a, a video on, on, the, on the experience of Roger Mono. I'm sure I still have it on my records, but I could send it to you. Roger Mono was a devil worshiper. He was, a, he, was, he was being groomed to be a master. You know, they, 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 they referred to them as grandmasters, but he was supposed, he was being groomed to be a Grand master of of Satanism, he had he had he had seen stuff and done stuff himself, working his way up to the highest levels because they saw he had gifts or talents that would have enabled him to be a tremendous instrument in the hand of Satan, and he was moving up the ranks so quickly until he encountered. Christ. He, he, he met some Adventists who started to study the fundamental beliefs of Adventism with him. And he realized his life was at stake. So he had them to study with him. So many different studies every night until they were finished with all the studies. And then he was ready for battle. Roger Morno. Roger Morno. He, he passed away just around the time we were planning to bring him in. We were gonna, we were gonna invite him to come and, and visit our church and give a lecture, but he, he passed away before we could have done it. But yeah, I will make the video available to you, and and and, and it is it is, it is in book. It's M O R N E A U. N E A U. Roger Morno. And he 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 um. But anyway, what I want to share with you is on one occasion when Satan came to him <laughs> and he started to talk about Jesus because he, he, he came to understand the power of Christ and how Jesus was not going to leave him alone if he called on him, he would, he would come to his aid. So he, he well, on one particular occasion, it happened to him on more than one occasion, but on the one particular occasion, the, 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 Satan came after him to, to try and take revenge over the fact that he had crossed over the line and moved over from Satanism or spiritualism to Adventism. And he had already learned from the spirit world that the most dangerous Christians were Seventh-day Adventists. 
because they, the spirits reveal to them that Seventh-day Adventists know the truth about spiritism mm -hmm. and the state of the dead. Remember we talked about that being one of the foundational beliefs? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, they know that. And they told him when they were grooming him to be a grandmaster that those were the people that he needed to be more concerned about and don't even talk to them, don't have anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, when Satan had visited him on this occasion that I'm talking about, this brother, he knew he was in the Lord's hands and he knew how to ensure that he could have been secured. So he called upon the Lord and he said he was going to call upon the Lord. And before he, before he could even have the Lord come to him, the devil could not get out of that room any faster than he could. Mm -hmm. He was out of there like a light and shook up the place. He tore the door off. Yes, he, yeah. yeah, he tore the door off in the process of getting away. Mm -hmm. Brethren, you and I don't know what we have. When, when you have Christ, you have everything. We just have to reacquaint ourselves with him and get to the point where we can truly believe. You see that faith that it talks about? We have to truly believe in what we are taught in the fundamental truths of Adventism. We have to believe what the Bible says. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And the only way to resist it is not by you turning around and ignoring him. You resist him by calling upon Christ. You, that's our only defense. We have nothing to offer to protect ourselves from a being that has <coughs> supernatural power, like Satan. But Jesus, he's afraid of, of that name. So yes, in spiritual stamina, we have to have that faith. Let's go quickly to Ephesians 6. And look at verse 16. Ephesians 6, 16. <clears throat> Above all, now this is this is the chapter that deals with all the all the different um, defenses that we could use, the, 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 the full armor of God. And the last one it tells you, above all, take in the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So it tells you about the helmet, it tells you about the, 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 the shoes that you, 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 you have to put on, it tells you of the breastplate and all the other aspects, uh, the helmet of salvation, etc. All of that, but then it tells you above all, above all of these things, Make sure you have the shield of faith. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. with that shield, you can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. If you trust in God, you will call on Him. You, you, if you really trust in the Lord, you will call on Him. And you will call on Him with a consciousness that you believe He is going to come and take care of you. If you have that kind of faith, as small as that is, you can move mountains, including Satan. You just have to believe he will take care of you. I shared with some of you about the, the angel thing, and that was just angels. I was just putting faith in angels protecting me. And boy, did they come and help me. Could you imagine for Jesus? <laughs> you just have to believe it and apply it. And it works. I'm going to close off with this last reference. This is the secret of Christ's victorious life. And it's not meant to be kept a secret because inspiration was given permission to reveal to us how Jesus did it. But the life of Jesus was a life of constant trust sustained by continual communion. And his service for heaven and earth was without failure or faltering. In other words, this was the secret of Christ's perfection. There was nothing he failed in. Why? Because his faith was so strong, you couldn't even just call it faith. It was trust. He had a confidence in his Father. 
that's where we will be after we get so accustomed calling on the Lord and seeing him answer us and deliver us and bless us and help us. You do that enough, you end up having your faith transformed into a confidence, a trust. It's not just faith. It's not just an exercise of, I am going to try to believe you, Lord. It is going to be, I trust you. You, you I know you got it. I have nothing to worry about. You know, it's like a little child who knows that when mommy and daddy are there, they have nothing to worry about. At first, it is, boy, I, can I, can I, can daddy do this or can mommy? No. After mommy and daddy shows them what they can do over and over again, then it's like, okay, mommy is here. That's where we've got to get. And the only way we could get to that point is if we keep applying this item. And the only way the Lord could get us to get accustomed to apply this item is to allow problems to come to us. Our problem is we don't apply the signs to everything. The Lord wants us to. He wants us to call upon him. Look at Jesus. He was in continual communion. And that is what strengthened his trust. That is what made his trust consistent. It never faltered. It never failed. Because he was continually in communion with his Father. And that just sustained his trust sustained his confidence, sustained his dependence and assurance that God would be in his corner. And once he got to that point, he never failed in anything and nothing ever overcame him. Not even self. We've got to get to that point. We don't pray enough and we don't pray quality prayers in terms of using that talent at the times when <coughs> we need it most, which is when problems come. We, so, we are supposed to be able to pray when we're happy. You know why? Because when we're happy, we know where the joy came from. Have you ever stopped and, and, and looked within yourself and wonder why it is you feel so peaceful and happy? I've, I've done it. And I wonder why it is I feel so okay. And you know what I had to conclude every time? It's the joy of the Lord. He's just given me a grace, the, the assurance that he's with me. And that is just making me happy because he's there. Bible talks about a peace that surpasses all human understanding. You ever had a peace that you just don't understand? Where it be? The Lord. If we understand that the Lord is just a volume of not just energy, but joy. All the fruits of the Spirit are what emanates from Him. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering. You, you'll, be, you'll be the epitome of a human Christ. Why? Because he is there with you. In you. And you cannot but be in a position where you enjoy his presence. That's where we have to be every day. Every day. And one of the, one of the triggers or one of the, the mechanisms for allowing that experience Simple communion with the Lord brings him to you. Call, and I will answer you and show you marvelous things that you know not of. He, he just wants, he just wants to, 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 to reveal himself to us all the time if we if we would give him a chance. But Jesus understood that and he kept he kept he kept him close to him all the time. We don't want the Lord to be close to us all the time. Because then we can't do our mischief. We can't feed our carnal nature. So we, we don't mind him sitting down for a while so we can indulge 
but if we if we can commune with him to, to keep us and sustain us and protect us and and ensure us that that he is in control, we are going to experience the joy of the Lord all the time. Even in the midst of the storms of life. We will experience it because he's going to reveal to us, God, I've got this. And we'll get to a point where we will stop worrying. And people will be wondering like, what we are going to see during the time of the loud cry and even thereafter, people are going to be wondering, why is it that these people keep on doing what they're doing? And no matter what we say, no matter how loud we roar, they still keep on doing it. It's because we are secure in Christ. The Lord doesn't want us to learn that and experience that only when the trouble comes. He wants us to learn and experience it ahead of the trouble so that we will continue to seek the experience during the trouble. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it does. So, brethren, I want to close by just expressing the fact that we we have a tremendous experience ahead of us, the Antichrist and spiritualism in a mighty way, paving the way as it will, for the Lord to empower us so that we can deliver others. We've got to learn to have our experience of going back to where we were, where the Lord became the center of our strength, the center of our lives, and not feel as though that is baby stuff. It's not baby stuff stuff, with wise stuff. We need to see the value of something and not throw it away, you know, like how parents would tell children, don't, don't, don't destroy the, your toys. You know, you know, you, you know they are there for you to play with, but don't destroy them. The kids have the notion that if they destroy that one, they'll get another one or something else that they want. No. You don't, des you don't destroy your first love. In this case, when he has proved unto us that he can take care of business, then you want him to take care of bigger business. As you get older, you want him to be there to take care of those things too. That's what he wants to reveal to us. So we have to get into that frame of mind where we begin to really appreciate, I am a Seventh-day Adventist for a reason. And if to me personally, one of the highest honors I could have or experience as a Christian is to be able to be among those who get the battle of power. Because there's nothing else greater than that as far as being able to work for God in this life that, that, that has been offered or will be uh, um, imparted going forward. To be able to get that ladder in. You get that ladder in and you go and do the work of the Lord during that law card time, and you know you're going to end up being sealed. And to be sealed means, because that during that during that time when they pass the legislation, that's the time that inspiration says that the angels are going to be moving to and through and sealing the saints. So, 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 <laughs> We gotta make it to that point. We make it to that point, we have nothing to worry about. After a while, according to Ezekiel, Ezekiel 36 says that the Lord will, will then take out this stony heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. You know what that means? That means today we are struggling to resist sin and to accept the things of God. In the morrow, we are going to be struggling For what? Nothing. Because sin will no longer be a problem to us. We don't have to struggle to fight against sin anymore. When you get at heart of flesh, that means you are totally converted. And the Bible says that if he who is born again cannot commit sin, that's what we will experience at that point in time. So we've got to get to the point where our experience of the Lord becomes 
greatest pursuit and our greatest achievement. Because once we get there, we get power. Once we get the power, we know we'll get the seal. Because nobody's going to get the power who are not going to be saved. And Wright said, the seal of God will not be placed upon the forehead of an impure man or woman. Well, by the time you get that power, you are going to be clean. But yet, the final phase, the phase of us, you know, seeking the Lord earnestly to keep us, that's when Ellen White said, God is going to uproot every single connection we have with Satan. It's going to be gone. So what could he do to, what, what, what else could he do for a person who has, who has had every aspect of Satan uprooted from them? lock them in in righteousness. Mm -hmm. So there's not even a, the slightest desire for evil afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's where we will be before Jesus returns. If we go through the experience of the latter rain and we get into the time of trouble and the Lord seals us in the early stages before we even flee to the mountains and hills, we will be locked in with God. There will be no such thing as a desire to do any wrong at that point in time, after that. All we'll be doing is waiting for his coming. Don't you like to be there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we don't have a long stretch of time before we could get there. We just need to be able to have an understanding of the closing events and stop getting ourselves caught up with the world and the news and the and, and the and the trouble and what the Pope did today if he fell down on the on the door <laughs> yesterday or whatever. What does that what, what does that have to do with God's plan? I think people people get to and wrap with Satan's plan instead of God's plan. We need to be focused on what the Lord has in store for us and work towards being a part of it. Or as all those other things, like Diana was saying this morning about our focusing on the problems of our health issues or even ourselves. What the devil does, he takes us and he focuses us on ourselves. You know how much we have inside of us that will make us unhappy. <laughs> if we start to look at ourselves and see all our weaknesses, shortcomings, and the failures of the past, that's not going to make us happy. But when the Lord can take our eyes away from us and we focus on strength, when we focus on Christ, we're focusing on strength. We are so focusing on hope, we are focusing on deliverance, we are focusing on victory. That's where our eyes need to be all the time. And I will shut up now. <laughs> Anyone have any question or comment before we close? I'm stating uh, First John, First uh, John chapter two, uh, four. Okay, First John chapter four, verse eighteen. <laughs> First John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fear is not made perfect in love. So, uh, can we say, once we are complete in Christ's character, that, that last round in 2 Peter chapter 1, chapter, mm -hmm. that take us into glory, once we have that, that, that last round, that, that love complete in Christ, it will remove all fear. Well, I, 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 I agree with that, and I'll go one step further and say it doesn't, it, the emphasis does not just lie in what we have, it, 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 it really lies in what God is. Well, if, if, if we, when, when we are told there's no fear in love, if I know that I am in the care of someone who loves me, I won't fear anything. So it's not so much dependent upon what I possess as much as what I believe he possesses. So that, that goes back to I mean, one of the quotes that you always quote in education. Yeah. Faith is trusting God. He knows that, that he loves, loves us. He and knows the best for what we do for our Instead of me, my own way, that's trust right. Him. You see, the, 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 the real essence of victory is not 
so much what we do, what we have, what we achieve. It is what God is. That's the essence of victory. If I can believe in God, if I can believe He is who He says He is, if I could believe that He is really interested in my best good, then why should I worry about anything else afterwards? If He is the one that I'm drawing to be. If I could actually believe that the Lord is with me and believe He's everything that the Bible says He is, then I am victorious. Uh, uh, so, so there's no fear in love. If I have confidence, it's like, it's like I was using the illustration with children. If a child knows that, you know, the illustration of the little boy who came to the attic of the house and he sees the light is, is, is dark down there because the father went down into the attic and it's real dark down there. The little boy looks down, he sees nothing but darkness. And he calls out, Daddy, are you there? And Daddy says, yes, I'm here, son. He says, but I don't see you. He says, yes, son, but I'm here. Jump. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he says, but Daddy, I, I don't. He says, it's okay, I'm here, son. I'll catch you. Jump. And the boy jumps right into the father's arms. You know why? Because he knew the father loved him. Mm. Okay. It was worse too. Yeah, yeah. I think we had those voices. Yeah, well the voice <laughs> proved to him that Daddy was really there. The voice was the proof that Daddy was there. But that didn't mean that he, he had to believe that and trust that. Trust that. Yes, he was he going sure to catch him. Daddy said jump and I will catch you. Mm -hmm. The little boy jumped. The father caught him. That little fellow knows what faith is real about. Mm. And the Lord is trying to tell us that because he's doing it a different way for us. He's given us evidence when we call upon him and he answers us. He's given us evidence after evidence. But you know this is our human problem. We forget to so. We forget. We do not, we do not, we do not take a record and keep a record of God's goodness towards mm. us. So the next time around the test comes, <laughs> there we are, starting all over again, trying to figure out if we could trust Him. It's got to get to a point where, where we build on what we know the Lord has already done. Look back and see the last place we saw Him. <coughs> you might me remember everything that happened five years ago, but if you look back last week or a few days ago when you know you saw the Lord, when the Lord, you called upon him and he did something for you or he blessed you, even when you didn't ask for the blessing, mm -hmm. then you can have a, a stimulus for building that confidence again. But we, the Lord is looking for people who will build on it every day so that they will be assured by the end of every week that they know who God is, like that boy. I think, I think partly what comes in the way of us really trusting the Lord is our sins. Yeah. The devil keeps us thinking back, you know, we thought we failed yesterday, or we, we, have, we lack confidence because of our condition. But I like the way today, you know, I, I was just thinking before you, the whole day, until this afternoon, we didn't mention, I don't, the all I know, sin, at one, not, not one time you mentioned sin, until this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So you was taking us, the Lord was leading through the messages away from sin and, and trusting in Christ. You know, and so it's just like, I remember when I, when I, I got my teeth pulled a while, a while back, and the, and, and the doctor came in, Dennis came in, he was looking at my teeth, talking to me, you know, and he just, I don't know, how you doing? He was talking to me, and he started shooting me up, getting my, 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 my gums numb, and while he was talking to me, he was pulling. Yeah. So he was distracting me from the mm -hmm. pain and, mm -hmm. and what I was going through. Was, so that's what God does when we fall in love with him. We take our eyes off, off of ourselves and our sin, right. and God can take that away from us. And he said, man, I didn't, I didn't have no bad thoughts today because mm -hmm. I was in fellowship with Christ. Right. So that's what God wants to do for us. It's, right. It's he directs our attention. Right? I, 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 think, I think, you know, personally, 
you know, if we if we get to the point where you know, and, and you read the scripture itself that how perfect love casts out all mm -hmm. fear. Who other than God has perfect love? I don't know anybody that has perfect love <laughs> other than God. So if I can experience God, really believe that He is who He says He is, and that He will do what He says He will do, if I could believe that, why should I fear? Why? You know, I'll just, I'll just say this quickly. You know, this lawsuit that the GC has brought against us has really been a very challenging thing as far as having to deal with one thing after the other because you have to be constantly being briefed by the attorneys, having to supply certain uh, pieces of information and all that goes along with uh, building the case. But to me, one of the biggest lessons the Lord taught us over the years with this whole thing of dealing with, with, with men in high places is when in 2008 they had sent us the cease and desist letter. You know, we've never been to court with the GC. This is going to be our first time. But when they sent us our first cease and desist letter, here am I. Mere human being, little seven day Adventist, coming up against the general conference of every Adventist. Even at that time, I could not have fathomed it. But it was put in the hands of the Lord. We went to the Lord about it. Lord, here these people are telling us if we don't stop calling ourselves Adventists. At that time, it was just Adventists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> If we don't stop calling ourselves Adventists, they're going to take us to court. We don't have the money to go in, into court and fight a multi-billion dollar organization. But we took it to the Lord. And the Lord told us what to do. And all we did was provide the evidence that we were in possession of a charter, which is the Berean Church of Free Seventh-day Adventist Charter, that was older than their trademark. Mm -hmm. The trademark was from 1981, and our charter goes all the way back that the Berean Church was registered in 1916. The Lord put that on our hearts. But we would not have thought of it, nor would we have pursued it if we did not Turn to the Lord for mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. Amen. We did what he said. And what did the Lord do? The GC backed away when they saw what we had. Backed off. Little us. <laughs> <laughs> but be God. If we hide behind God, he could take care of business. So he taught us that he curved. Now we come up a, to a bigger challenge. What should we do? The same thing we did before. Go to the Lord. He will direct our path. If we look to him. Because what he gave to us means more to him than it, than it does to us. And we have to trust in that. So as much as it is a big challenge when you stop to think about who you're coming up against and all the inconvenience of having to accumulate this and accumulate that piece of entry and coming accumulate it's a lot of inconvenience and time consumption and monetary expense God you go to the source and let your faith in what he did before lead you down the path of what he is capable of doing. And that's why I say many times I think what happens is that we forget what God has done for us. And if we could 
maybe even keep a record sometimes of what God has done for us and go to it at the times when a new challenge comes and your faith may be faltering some and review not just his love but his power and then you end up facing the challenge with a lot more confidence not in yourself but in what God can and is willing to do I was going to say, even if it doesn't seem to be uh, you're coming up against something big, even if it seems small, yes. you still want to get God on your side. Don't go into it without him. Correct. Look what happened to the Israelites right. when they thought, uh, no problem. Yeah. They went into it without God, and they, got, yeah. they got demolished. That's right. That's those, those are the dumbbells, you know, the little five pound ones or three pound ones mm -hmm. <laughs> those, those are the things that helps to exercise the faith muscle mm -hmm. the, the small things are not to be ignored because they are going to be dealt with with the same solution mm -hmm. God so yes in the big things and in the small things we need to call upon him and our faith will just grow grow grow, grow. anyway brethren I have taken up a lot of time with you all today and I am truly grateful that the Lord allowed Diane and I to be here with you all today. I hope that we could be back again and I know that um, it would be another enjoyable fellowship with all of you. So we'll try and see if we can work out something by the grace of God. Amen. Yeah. And we need to make sure we have some songs ready, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would appreciate it. I don't know if all the all the leaders of the church or all the officers of the church are here, but I would like to have a little meeting with you before we leave today, if possible. Uh, I know I've already kept you off for a while, but if that is possible, I'll appreciate it. And I'll, and I'll make it short. <laughs> all right, who, you this time, with, who you stay with them? The, the leaders of the church. Whoever are the officers of the church. Okay, let's go ahead and close up with a word of prayer. We aren't even going to sing the close. <laughs> so uh, I know I've kept you all long enough already. We can't sing, they is that in the West. Okay. <laughs> now, I didn't say it. <laughs> okay, let's stand and we we'll close up with uh, what number is it? <laughs> Thank you. We stand in the west, uh, number 31.